Welcome to part two of An Experiment in Democracy. I'm Brian Lehrer, coming to you this hour from the CUNY Graduate Center in Midtown Manhattan at 34th and 5th, right across the street from the Empire State Building. We have a live audience here of several hundred people, and we will continue now with our attempt to do two important things, two things that I think you'll find very interesting to listen to and, in a way, participate in as you listen. Number one is what we'll discuss, the best ways to keep our subway safe in an age of urban terrorism and not violate civil liberties. Number two is how we'll discuss it, discuss it as an experiment in deliberative democracy. If you missed part one, here's how it'll work. We will poll our audience about their views on some of the MTA's new subway security programs and plans, this time about the hundreds of surveillance cameras they plan to install and the cell phone service they want to bring to platforms. Then we'll present the audience with an array of guests, and at the end of the hour, we'll poll the audience again to see how the burden of actual information and other people's opinions changes their views, if at all. And once again, you can participate, too, as you listen on the radio. All you've got to do is listen with an open mind. So let's get back to it. I've asked Guy Martin, terrorism columnist for New York Magazine and Condé Nast Traveler, to help me out here by helping me count hands. Are you ready to assume your role as instant public opinion communicator? Absolutely, as long as everybody knows that I'm not monitoring them. And again, your job, or so you say, is to tell us roughly what percentage of the audience answers yes to these questions and make any observations about who those people are. And uh, we will call this our informal, unofficial, thoroughly unscientific audience poll. The city has announced plans to install cell phone service inside hundreds of underground subway stations. Do you think this is a good idea? Raise your hands if the answer is yes. Got Ryan, it? I have to say, I think we have a... a, a quorum here, uh, certainly, and, and also I think a majority, uh, by a slight fraction, perhaps 75, 60, 60 hands maybe? maybe? Maybe not that much of a percentage though. How about no? How, how many of you don't think it's a good idea? Um, less than half. Less, less than, than the half. number of people less who raise half. their hands saying yes, but a fair, a fair number. Those with mixed feelings? Are there people undecided or ambivalent? And the ambivalents are currently in third place with perhaps 20 hands. Okay. There's also a plan to install hundreds of surveillance cameras. Actually, I think the number is 1,000 in subway stations. How many of you think off the bat that this is a good idea? Also a slight, I'm guessing a slight majority? Looks to me like a slightly bigger majority. Slightly bigger with, majority. With okay. cell phones, I would think. How many of you do not think this is a good idea? You're right. Um, Much less division than on far, the cell phone. Far less division. Yeah. All right. So let's take your temperature on this uh, real quick. On the cell phones, who said no? Somebody want to raise their hand again on the no side and give us a, a nutshell as to why. Uh, so let's go to that person right there who's walking toward the aisle in the microphone. Uh, really has nothing to do with security. I don't see how cell phones will make things safer or less safe, but people are generally totally inconsiderate when they're on their cell phone, and I just don't want to listen to it. <laughs> so that's one downside that draws a rousing round of applause. Anyone else on, on the no side? Who else do we have who wants to say why not other than... Or is that the main reason for the people who said no? Raise your hands. Did he articulate it? Okay, uh, I guess he did. What about, uh, what about yes? Those who said yes to cell phones, somebody, which was a slight majority, anyone want to give us, anyone want to give us a quick thumbnail as, uh, as to why yes? Yes, on this side. I said yes, uh, mostly, probably because, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I lean more toward yes, I understand that it could be uh, a bad thing too because terrorists could use it to their advantage as well um, but when you're on the ground you have an emergency going on well cell phone will you know will do the trick most of the time if you have cell phone service on the ground all right now in a way these are the easy questions here come some harder ones raise your hand if you agree with the following statement about privacy and behavior a compilation of quotes from law professor Jeffrey Rosen about the half million surveillance cameras currently in use in London. He said, video surveillance cameras have far-reaching social costs. They are instruments of classification and exclusion and technologies of social conformity. 
They are ways of putting people in their place, of deciding who gets in and who stays out. Who tends to agree with that? Who, Guy? I'm looking at about 20% of your audience. Who disagrees with that? We're looking at not quite 60% maybe, something like that? What, yeah. do you, what do you reckon? Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't want to split hairs. Maybe, I'll well, take more, your names after this. More than, more than, uh, more than, than the other answer. Yeah. And mixed feelings, ambivalence on this. A lot of ambivalence on this. Can Big anybody articulate your ambivalence? I think maybe ambivalence wins. On, on this side, we have a hand up with somebody who's going to say why you have mixed feelings about that statement. And this gentleman who's walking toward the aisle microphone right now. Hi. Oh, sorry. Um, I think the ambivalence comes from, I agree with people, and you know, state property has a right to protect uh, their investment to view verse crime, graffiti, whether it be terrorism or not. But also, I think video surveillance can be abused and probably will be abused in that effort. So. Raise your hand now if you agree more with these lines, and I'll tell you who said them later. Public cameras have now identified suspects in the most recent London terror attempt. They also broke the 7-7 London bombings. Yet few crime-fighting technologies have inspired more hysterical rhetoric from privacy nuts than cameras. The ability to identify perpetrators is the next best thing after prevention. Agree? That looks like about half of everybody. Yeah, maybe, maybe less. Disagree? Slightly less, yeah. Okay, slightly way, less. Way down. Way less disagreement than agreement with this station, all right, with that statement. Uh, we're going to ratchet it up another level. The city of London has already announced plans to use high-tech body scanners that peer through clothing. <laughs> Would you support that in New York? This is according to the New York Times, by the way. <clears throat> Who would support that in New York? Almost nobody to start out. Five guys. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. What about a brain scan device not yet invented that can read brain waves that indicate a propensity toward criminal activity? <laughs> Okay, all right. Well, those two examples come from the New York Times Magazine cover story on August 28th by law professor Jeffrey Rosen. Um, one was a hypothetical. The other one, he says, really is coming to London. The person who wrote the lines about the, uh, the ability to identify perpetrators of surveillance cameras being the next best thing to prevention was Heather McDonald from the Manhattan Institute who continues with us in part two of this panel. And here we go again after that deliberative democracy poll. Here comes information and an array of opinion. Um, and there, there was an interesting amount of ambivalence on some of these things to start out. So I'm going to be very interested in this case to see how people are affected. So with me now to talk about both cell phones in the subways and the surveillance plans, uh, plans announced by the MTA, as well as some that London is installing and considering are Heather McDonald, Olin Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and um, Guy Martin, who's been helping us out on the polling here, terrorism columnist for New York Magazine and Condé Nast Traveler. This is what it's come to. We used to have movie critics and wine columnists in magazines like Condé Nast Traveler. Now we have terrorism columnists. Um, it's a growth business. <laughs> Robert Buzz Passwell, director of the Transportation Research Center in the Institute of Urban Systems at CUNY and a distinguished professor of civil engineering at City College, and Donna Lieberman, executive director of the New York Civil Liberties Union. Welcome, Donna. Buzz Passwell, explain some of the engineering here first, if you can. The plan is to put 1,000 video cameras and 3,000 motion sensors in the subways, in addition to enabling cell phone service in 277 stations out of the 468. What will these cameras see? What will they do? I can only tell you what I've read in the paper, since you know, or anybody who tries to talk to the MTA knows that the real information about that is, is embargoed. It's difficult to get. But I can sort of tell you what my, some of my friends tell me. One is, is the video cameras uh, are, are good surveillance for a number of things, not just for for, for preventing terrorism and, and uh, for, for dealing with, with events after terrorism, 
but for basically uh, improving the quality of service. That's something that, that it's probably beyond the discussion of, of where we want to want to go tonight. But the idea of the transit authority, let's say with best intentions, having the idea of understanding both where all their passengers are and where all their equipment are makes it able for them to deploy the equipment in better ways or move people in better ways, uh, either out of harm's way or, or, or away from incidents. But I think listening to the first hour and the, and the second hour, and I don't want to be critical of our host, but I think you've been led down one single path, and the path is that uh, everything is, is, is geared to prevent terrorism. And I think all of us who ride the subway every day, and I, I think the real question should have been asked, not do you feel safer with this or do you feel safer with that, do you feel safe riding the subways and do you feel safe riding the buses and could you feel safer and do you think that the city and the transit system are doing enough to make you feel safe? And then the question is what would you do to improve that, not just sort of take individual little things which collectively might have a whole different effect than individually thinking of them sort of in, in, in little, uh, little, uh, uh, little ways. But there are three parts to events. One is preventing terrorism where you can, and that's really almost outside the scope of the transit authority and the police. If it's international terrorism, it, it really becomes part of our government's responsibility and sort of on down to figure out what, what, these, what, what these terrorists are and how they will attack and how can we then, when they come into our area, do our best to, to sort of recognize and attack them? So the British with, knew this, with the, respect to the surveillance cameras, right. do you think they're more to prevent terrorism or more to catch people after the fact? I think, I think if you take it together, surveillance cameras, random searches, uh, which on the surface don't sound like great ideas, having, I think, having more policemen in stations, are probably more than anything else, you need more presence of... of of uh, uniform policemen. What you, what you want to do is always raise the stakes for someone who's, who's coming in with some bad ideas, and you want to make them think maybe it's going to be a little bit more difficult today than it was yesterday to do it. It isn't that you're going to catch this person now or catch that person then. The second reason that you want to install the technology is in the event that, that God forbid, some event does occur, one is you want to make the event pass as quickly as possible. And the British in all their brilliance, did that. The next day, the subways and buses were running. That evening, the subways were running. That same day, because they had, they had the ability to broadcast information over the whole system, as soon as, uh, about three or four minutes after a, a, a bomb went off on a bus, and you haven't talked about buses, we've got as, you know, as many buses as subway cars, we should think of that too. As soon as a, a, a bomb went off on a bus, Within about 15 minutes, every single bus in London was evacuated. Every single bus. And that's because they had the ability to communicate this information. So you want to you want to mitigate the effects of the event after it occurs, and then uh, in the aftermath, you want to bring the system back up to normalcy. So you need basically as much communications technology as you can get to, to make this occur. So just talking about should we do a random search here or have a TV camera intruding on me there? That's, that's only a bit and piece of the answer. The real answer is collectively will all of these, one, help make us all feel secure when we ride the subway, and secondly, if something does happen on the subway, will we be secure and able to get away afterwards? We'll continue in a minute with more of the technology and the civil liberties implications. Brian Lehrer on WNYC. I had a heart attack when I was 48. You'll be okay. I survived, but I'll always be at risk for another. What do you got? I think she's having a heart attack. And my heart may never be the same. Two, three. Heart disease is the number one killer of women. Now I'm taking steps to lower my risk. But I wish I'd done it earlier, for myself and for my family. The heart truth starts with you. Find out your risk and take action to lower it. My neighbors, Gene and Louise, they may be superheroes with superpowers, but that doesn't make them so super at saving energy and money. 
I mean, I like them at all. But when Gene uses that power vision to cook dinner? Honey! Or, or, or when Louise or Starbright tries to save a little on the lighting bill? Mom, a little light? I may not be able to harness the power of the elements, but I save significant cash and help the environment with appliances, electronics, and windows featuring the Energy Star label. And I improve my home energy efficiency with insulation. My thermostat? Watch this. I'm just kidding. It's programmable. I don't have to lift a finger to save on AC and heating. Mom, Dad's making fun you again. So discover your own energy saving superpowers. Go to ASE.org slash consumers. Brian Lehrer on WNYC with our Deliberative Democracy Experiment, Part 2, Subway Security, Our Random Searches, Surveillance Cameras and Cell Phones, What New York Needs. We've polled our live audience on some of their views and we're presenting them with information and opinion and see how it affects them. Uh, we will do that later on in the hour. Talking now mostly about surveillance techniques, and we'll get back to cell phones as well. Guy Martin, terrorism columnist for New York Magazine and Condé Nast Traveler, you've been looking at this from an international perspective. How common is this type of thing in mass transit systems around the world? Deeply. Um, the Germans have uh, particular laws against it because of their, should we say, mid-20th century, uh, less than stellar uh, profiling history. Um, and they have actually they have actually laws that are that are really literally the result of uh, post-war um, um, post-war and 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 uh, High Commissioner McCloy that are still on the books today against uh, cameras uh, being trained on the populace. But the German police, for instance, monitor 15 times they eavesdrop 15 times the number of cell phone conversations that the American FBI and police forces do. The Italians monitor 120 times more cell phone and telephone conversations. In London, of course, the, the famous, uh, the infamous and famous uh, forensic value uh, of, the, of, the, of the almost global or universal video surveillance is, is uh, or ubiquitous in, in, at any rate, is, um, is justly famous. And it justly justified itself in its swift forensic explication of the 7th of July and 21st of July bombings. So it's a, it's a patchwork quilt would be the general answer. Specifically, you're going to see heavier forms of surveillance in specific countries for specific reasons. The London subways are already famous for being surveillance camera heavy, and yet the two sets of attackers this summer apparently had no problem getting on. So before we even ask the civil liberties questions, how much should this dull our enthusiasm for these things just at the level of effectiveness? There's almost no preventative value to a camera. Zero. Um, there is a deterrent value. I mean, a small deterrent value. Uh, but I think uh, as the owners of convenience stores across the nation in high and low crime districts would probably testify, their surveillance cameras often only, only record their robberies. Um, and this new wrinkle in the London system that Jeffrey Rosen wrote about in the New York Times magazine recently that he says involves high-tech scanners that see through clothing. Are you familiar with that guy? Um, I know as much as I've read. Uh, I've, I've not had the chance to see it in action. But I, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand from my knowledge of air cargo screening for the traveler and also for, from, from baggage screening and airport screening of humans generally that, um, that yeah, the technology's there. It's, What's it uh, looking for? I think metal and or, and or, well, C4 and uh, Simtex and those compounds are organic compounds, so it's, it's hopefully going to be strong enough to detect uh, those. But x-rays are not necessarily a, a, a silver bullet. They, they can't really see, a lot, uh, you know, everything. Now, Donna Lieberman, executive director of the New York Civil Liberties Union, uh, your group, I understand, has done some kind of surveillance camera census in Manhattan. What did you find? Well, we're actually on our second round of the uh, surveillance camera uh, survey. Uh, back in 1998, we uh, did a survey of uh, all of Manhattan, 
and were astounded to learn that there were about 2,300 surveillance cameras, most of them private, um, uh, some of them government cameras, uh, on the streets of Manhattan. Um, we started to repeat that survey this year uh, with a bunch of college students, and we planned to survey the entire borough of Manhattan and even some of the outer boroughs, but we found so many cameras that we really only made it through 20% of, of Manhattan. We found over 7,000 cameras in just 20% of uh, Manhattan. So, and the point of the survey is to help people understand that, that the, the surveillance camera uh, horse is really out of the barn. We are a surveillance society, and we have to address the, the multitude of questions that that raises. What kind of guarantees do we have in place, or do we have any, um, to protect us from the abusive uh, use of the material that's being collected. What's and what, being co what would be those potential abuses that you're worried about? Well, we got a hint of it. Um, uh, you know, we, we got a hint of it, you know, back with J. Edgar Hoover abusing personal information on people. Uh, we got a hint of it from the Nixon administration's, you know, list of bad guys. But we also got a hint of it very recently uh, in New York City when a, a video surveillance camera from the, housing, uh, from the housing police captured a man committing suicide on camera. Well, of course, the camera could do nothing to prevent the tragic suicide, but the videotape of that horrible event landed up on a porn site on the internet. That's the kind of abuse. Another kind of abuse happened during the Republican convention when the Fuji blimp was commandeered by the police department to engage in surveillance of protest activities. And what did we learn? Well, we learned that somebody operating that camera zeroed in on a couple uh, engaging in what they thought was private love activity on, in, on their roof, which was covered with trees. Right? This was not legitimate surveillance. This is police, rogue police officers abusing their authority, abusing surveillance, and that too could have ended up, you know, on, in fact, it did end up on television. They didn't even need the London technology. But <laughs> besides the number of cameras, I understand you're also troubled by today's digital surveillance camera technology and the things that they can do, like what? Well, um, digitization allows the government or whoever's taking the pictures to keep a permanent uh, profile, uh, a permanent database, and to search it. So whenever the government's taken our picture, whether it's on the subway platform in Times Square, on 72nd Street in Central Park, there's potentially a permanent record of our innocent activities. So the government can search to find out when or whether Donald Lieberman went to see a psychologist, an oncologist, a gynecologist. You know, I don't think that's anybody's business, and I don't think they should be keeping that information. Are they? I don't know. Do you? So Heather McDonald from the Manhattan Institute, um, we've heard no claim so far that surveillance cameras are likely to prevent a terrorist attack. And we heard Donna Lieberman's explication of what she thinks the civil liberties risks are. Why do you support them? It's a, it's a clear-cut case as far as I'm concerned. Number one, they only record public behavior. If you don't want to be seen by your fellow citizens in New York, by a police officer, don't go out in public. This is totally, well, this is public behavior. The analogy to J. Edgar Hoover's uh, surveillance abuses is completely inept. Uh, that was violating people's privacy expectations. I don't think in New York City, a city of seven, eight million, billion, million people, you have privacy expectations on city streets or in the subways. Stay at home if you don't want to be seen. Their value, I think, has been indisputably proven after the 7-7 seven, seven and 721 bombings and bombing attempts in London. A day after the 721 attacks, uh, the police were able to release four photos of the perpetrators. Uh, two days later, they had two names. And in reference to our earlier discussion about profiling, my guess is that when the police were searching 
the surveillance tapes on the subways and, and buses, they were not looking randomly. Uh, they had a very specific type of person they were looking for, which allowed them to release the perpetrator's uh, uh, identities. There is no evidence that London's half a million cameras have at all inhibited public behavior. The claims that this is, that Jeffrey Rosen makes that somehow this is going to create a terrified uh, repressed populace is ludicrous. There is no difference in public behavior in cities that have surveillance cameras and London's are well publicized. People are just as gregarious uh, and open on the streets as they are in any okay. other city. And the distinction, I think, actually, between prevention and after-the-fact investigation breaks down because the four guys that they got off the streets after 721, thanks to the cameras, if they were still out there, could easily have committed another attack. So, in fact, we have, I think, prevented another attack by our ability to immediately identify who the perpetrators were. Donna Lieberman, do you want to respond to that statement and that no. trade-off? Yeah. You know, the, the British home, uh, home Office did a study of the efficacy of, video, of, of its massive video surveillance program and found that, and I don't think that they wanted to find this, but they found no significant deterrent value. Um, I think that the, the, the London cameras demonstrate both the, 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 the benefits and the limitations of surveillance cameras. They don't prevent crime. Can they help us solve it after the fact? Yes. Is that important? Yes. But it's a different value than being a deterrent. And I think when we weigh what happens to our privacy as a result of a, a universal uh, surveillance society and, 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 and what kind of uh, uh, limits we place on the retention and who has access to uh, surveillance tapes, I think we have to take that into consideration as well. Brian Lehrer on WNYC with our special subway security, our random searches, surveillance cameras and cell phones, what New York needs. Um, Donna, do you want to take the Jeffrey Rosen statement that I read at the top of the hour and run with it? Um, where he was um, quoted by Heather in the context of critiquing him that video surveillance cameras have far-reaching social costs. They're instruments of classification and exclusion and technologies of social conformity. They are ways of putting people in their place, of deciding who gets in and who stays out. And yet Heather says if you look at London society, which is so surveillance camera rich, uh, there doesn't seem to be any sense of less gregariousness, less going out, less outgoingness in the city as a whole. Well, you know, um, I don't know how many people remember, you know, how horrific a scenario was painted by George Orwell in 1984. But, but we used to be appalled by that thought. And now, in fact, we're saying that video surveillance is a kinder, gentler kind of um, uh, uh, crime prevention or detection uh, or solving mechanism. But, but you know, the, 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 the notion of the government being able to catalog our every public move and keep track of it and hold on to it in the police department uh, for no reason necessarily at all raises, I think, a, should raise concerns. It may not hurt today. But, but, but it can hurt at any moment. And I think that, that it's very easy for us to go on with our lives assuming I'm doing nothing wrong, nothing's ever going to happen to me, nobody will ever abuse my pictures, um, is just really a little bit naive. And, and uh, we may not see it today, but I think that we, the, the technology is there so that we can see it down the pike. And one area where I think uh, we have to have particular concerns has to do with political demonstrations. I don't know whether any of you were at any of the demonstrations at the Republican National Convention. 
But, but the New York Police Department has a bit of a obsessive compulsive disorder about videotaping. They were videotaping every demonstration they could get their hands on. It wound up backfiring on them. And it backfired. It came up to bite them because the cops were saying, well, I observed this guy um, um, refusing to leave. And then lo and behold, the, the, there's, there's a videotape of the entire arrest and no order to leave. So maybe surveillance cameras in those contexts uh, protected civil liberties. Well, but... And, and that's not the only example, Brian. I mean, Rodney King, whoever, would that example ever have had the impact that it did without video surveillance? So do video you... surveillance is a double-edged sword. And, and, and the key to whether it becomes a, something that undermines our way of life or something that enhances it, I think is really a lot more subtle than we should have and where we shouldn't. And it's really in what kind of regulations we have. I want to open this back up to the audience, and I want to invite any questions for our guests, any thoughts about what you've been hearing so far, any questions about the technology, um, as well as the civil liberties issues, and uh, we will also return in a little while to the issue of cell phones, um, which, uh, which we've left aside for the moment. Do we have somebody on this side ready to go? Okay, hi. Hi, we're all missing the big point here. When we are at war with somebody, like World War I and World War II, we did not let the people from those countries come here. We are at war with Muslim terrorists. Don't let them in to start with, and then we won't be talking about having, having cameras all, all over the place. Thank you for that comment. Next speaker over there. Well, I, I just think that's ridiculous, because if you look at the... Um, uh, terrorist bombers in uh, London, they were homegrown. Um, but my question is, is different. Uh, it, um, and my question to all the panelists is this. It seems that the, what the terrorists are trying to do is to really frighten us. And they clearly um, reject democracy and the freedoms that we have become accustomed to, both in the US and in Europe. And don't you think that we're actually doing their job for them by, um, you know, we have surveillance cameras everywhere, we have police stopping people everywhere. That case you mentioned of uh, John Baptiste, who was uh, shot by the London SPD, was clearly a case of the police being in a panic and afraid and overreacting. So um, I just think that, you know, in, in effect, my question to you is, um, aren't we in fact doing what the terrorists, um, you know, um, we're allowing them to achieve their goals because we're becoming so afraid, we're watching each other, people are watching us on camera, we're watching each other in this room. Somebody, my friend here said to me, don't leave your bag while you go to the bathroom. Um, and, you know, what sort of society are we creating? Were well, you supposed to not leave your bag because people were watching or not watching? <laughs> Guy Martin, you want to respond to that? I'd love to have a chance to respond to that really smart question or a series of questions. Um, terror, by, by, by definition, is the bringing of war to the civilian realm. And so the challenge that we're offered here in London, in Madrid, in Moscow, in Riyadh, in Casablanca, in Tunis, in all of the towns that have had attacks in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, since 2001, is how far do we, are we, and are we supposed to militarize the civilian realm in order to defend it? Um, I would argue that tonight's symposium and the two panels and this incredible audience is a great example of how not to give in to the terrorists. Um, just the very fact of this debate is, is, is incredibly important. We're going to have to continue to discuss these things. We're going to have to really come to grips with some hard facts. During the great IRA, as the IRA would have thought about it, uh, siege of London in the 1970s and 80s, um, that's why London got militarized. That's why those cameras are there. The IRA put them there. Buzz Passwell, we have to take a break in about 30 seconds. Do you want to Yeah, I just to wanted to quickly point? say that you, you pose a real dilemma. Certainly you don't want to give in to the terrorists or stop life as you are, but neither do you want to make it so easy that someone is going to come in here and, and bring a bomb onto the subway. You want to make the terrorists feel that there's some risk in what they're doing. And, and I think the, the best example uh, for many of us in this room is 9-11. Is uh, for those of us who used to go to World Trade Center 1 or 2, we used to check in at the, at the first floor and, and get a picture ID, and that was the height of security. 
Well, you know, it didn't do anyone any good to, to, to do that. So now the question is, you know, do we go back and continue? We're doing that in all our other buildings around the city. But what else are we doing? You know, how are we going to put and, ourselves in the minds of terrorists? And that's the idea of, and, of what security is all about, putting yourselves we'll in the mind of terrorists. We'll so continue that you can it in a minute. Brian Lehrer on WNYC with our live public event. We didn't ask to be here, let's say it just happened. But now we are here, a word in your ear. We don't want your sympathy, we are stronger than you think. We don't want your tears, we have a river of our own. We can do without cynicism, indifference and abuse. We are not the problem, we are the solution. We will soon be the future, but right now we are the present. And in truth, we want for only one thing, your consideration, your children. Don't treat us like kids. You were once us. Give us the chance to become you. This is a story about the Living Reef, the oldest city on Earth. These wondrous complex communities are the most diverse places on the planet and are so important that the ocean cannot exist without them. And we cannot exist without the oceans. Unfortunately, Pollution and overfishing are destroying the world's coral reefs. We've already lost 25%, and the rest may perish within a generation, unless we act now. Protect the living reef, and we protect the ocean. Protect the ocean, and we protect ourselves. Brian Lehrer on WNYC with our Deliberative Democracy Experiment Part 2. Subway security, our random searches, surveillance cameras, and cell phones, what New York needs. We polled our live audience on some of their views, and we're presenting them with information and opinion to see how it affects them with our four guests. Guy Martin, terrorism columnist for New York Magazine and the Condé Nast Traveler. Donna Lieberman, executive director of the New York Civil Liberties Union. Heather McDonald, Olin Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and Robert Buzz Paswell, Director of the Transportation Research Center in the Institute of Urban Systems at CUNY, and Distinguished Professor of Civil Engineering at City College. Uh, Professor Paswell, did you want to finish a thought from before the break? I, I thought I finished it while you were... You, the point was, was basically that, that uh, uh, the, the whole idea, what you try to do and prevent terrorism uh, from the perspective of the agency, we've all put ourselves in the mind of the of the daily civilian, put yourselves in the mind of the people you've trusted with with ensuring your safety and security. Uh, when you all go on the subways or the buses, you 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 go on with the assumption that you're really going to get from where you start out to where you end up with with nothing untoward happening. But somebody sort of has to plan along with you that that's going to happen. And and when it comes to terrorism, it's a whole new ball game. You know, we're not used to that uh, in this country, and we we're learning lessons mainly live lessons. We've learned them from Spain, from England, from, from, from Tel Aviv. But the lesson we learned here in the United States was, was from the World Trade Center bombing, when we assumed that if the terrorists were going to come in, they were going to come in again either through the basement, where they didn't allow parking anymore, or just walk in the, into the elevators and, and go up to a floor. So if you had somebody's picture, they wouldn't be a terrorist. And I think we know that that's not true. What, what, what Agencies do now is they, they sort of invent scenarios. What are the you know what are the wildest things that the terrorists would, would could possibly do, and are we ready for that? And are there there are ways of us collecting information to make us ready for that? And that's sort of the, the casting about that's going on. So all the things we we've heard today, uh, we can think of are sort of little small steps on the way to perhaps 
uh, better informed ways of understanding what's going on. The real way to prevent terrorism, of course, is to stop it away, stop the causes of terrorism, which are a whole show outside the show. Or 25 shows or 2,500 shows. Right. Heather McDonald, do you have a position on the cell phone service? Do not. I, I, I think, actually, uh, people maybe we can hope will become more educated about cell phone courtesy in the future. <laughs> Hope, well, I'm an optimist in this one area. That was a fat chance laugh, wasn't it? <laughs> well, with New Yorkers glaring at them or throwing things at them, there's, there may be a chance of that. And I do think it's a balancing, and I think the possibility of, of being able to bring emergency services quickly or, again, somebody calling to the police the identity of somebody who just tried to do a mugging or, a, or, or bring a bomb outweighs the... Uh, the annoyance of hearing people talk about their shopping trip that day. Donna Lieberman, does the New York Civil Liberties Union have a position on cell phones? Um, no, but I'm glad you asked because I'd like to take this opportunity to comment on the question that was asked earlier. Um, uh, we live in an, in, a, in an era where we all feel vulnerable, and unfortunately our leaders in Washington have tried to prey upon our fears. We have an obligation uh, in, 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 in this society to preserve our democracy, and the way we do that is not to just roll over when John Ashcroft says, trust me, and not to just roll over when, when and he's still saying that, um, uh, and not to just accept blindly the need for random searches because Ray Kelly says it'll make you feel better. We ha when, when, when the government promulgates programs that undermine, that impair our, our freedoms, we have to ask the hard questions. Are they going to be effective? Do we need this in order to protect ourselves? And are there ways that don't interfere with our civil liberties that the government can utilize to make us safer. And I think that there are. And, and is the government doing everything that it can to maximum our safety and minimize the intrusion on our security? You know, you might be shocked to know that the police department didn't even talk to the MTA before it instituted the random bag search policy. I think that's kind of astounding. They didn't bother to talk to the experts about the efficacy of the program. We need a police department that doesn't seize on a terrible tragedy to, to, to gain some points. We need, and to give us the illusion of security, we need the police department to be consulting with the experts, to be coming up with programs that maximize our security and, and preserve at the same mm -hmm. time our freedom. Guy Martin. There is also some concern that cell phones can be used in terrorist attacks if yes. there's I, I was uh, just gonna, service. I was just going to speak to that. I, um, the alarms on, on the cell phones on 7-7 were, uh, were what was used to the alarm function. In other words, it's impossible to call anybody in the London Underground. In fact, this is one of the problems that the London rescuers and first responders had. They couldn't, they had no radio repeats down there. Um, but in terms of cell phones, uh, yes, they can be used to trigger uh, bombs, have been, are, and will still be. I think that's outweighed by the value of them, um, both in terms of um, emergency response and, and in terms of uh, people being able to communicate. So let's go back to the audience. Reactions to anything you're hearing, anything anybody wants to say or ask. We have someone right down here. Just off the aisle, go ahead. Uh, let me just step out here, please. Uh, yes, my name is John Weaver. Uh, uh, I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, let me say that um, I'm a camera design expert. Uh, I've been involved in developing advanced camera technology for about 15 years. And uh, I have to take uh, umbrage with uh, Mr. Martin. Uh, uh, Current camera technology is uh, approximately 65 years old and uh, is not really capable of performing to the, uh, to the expectations of the public or, for that matter, the officials. Uh, there are much more advanced systems that uh, are coming available now. Uh, I was uh, here in New York during 9-11 and uh, my company, uh, for all intents and purposes, disappeared. Uh, but uh, uh, through a lot of help from uh, government, uh, both the city, the state, and the federal government, they've kind of 
held my held me up with my hair. So as I was for, doing forgive it. me for asking so you to be to be brief, but what's the implication for what the city should be doing? Well, the, the, right now it's been announced that the city uh, MTA is going to spend 212 million dollars with Lockheed on a new security system, which includes cameras. Uh, the London subway system has rejected that system as being ineffective. And uh, that was published in the Post article on Sunday, MTA off track. So the system that they're about to buy is ineffective. I, I understand the technology reasons why it's ineffective. I understand what the London people are talking about. And let me, but it let says me get right here. Let me get a response. Guy Martin, are you familiar with London's objections to this particular system? I, I am not, but that doesn't mean that uh, the my interrogator is not correct. Let's uh, let, let me please. Okay. Uh, this is uh, from the Post of um, September 5th. The title of the article is MTA off track. Uh, quote. After testing in London, transit officials there found the cutting-edge equipment didn't recognize suspicious activity. Okay, Robert, oh, Robert, well, you're talking about an algorithm. You're talking about an algorithm that's been written into the into the mainframe. Is that right? Is that what they're? Is that what the failing is? Because the digitized pictures actually do work. All right. All right. Let's go to another questioner on this side. Yes, way yeah. in the back over there. And sir, thank you for your. That's an important. Point I'm wondering you if you can, uh, can comment on a scheme I read about in the New York Times magazine a year or two ago about using the internet and uh, computer technology to distribute images so you can scale the amount of surveillance you do and uh, potentially make it more of a proactive system where you could have uh, automated quality control and so you can look at behaviors of certain people and say, hey look, there's the guy on the platform, maybe we should ask him some questions instead of just having three or four board uh, police officers in a in a room, we could distribute the uh, the viewing globally, make it anonymous, and uh, make it scalable. And whether or not you think that would be uh, hopefully uh, effective in being proactive in preventing events. Robert Paswell, you have a reaction to that? Well, you know, let me just go back to this, this other question about and, and about uh, uh, pattern recognition software. The whole idea of, of from what I read again in in the in the newspapers uh, is that. Uh, if a package is left someplace for a certain amount of time, either motion sensors or something else will focus in on it, and then pattern recognition will say it's a suitcase or something. The, the, the people in London, the people in Israel have something far better. Their population has been trained to recognize when something is left standing by itself. I think one of the issues, and, and we, in, in the first panel and the second panel, it never really got down to saying that the first part of deterrence are the riders themselves. They have to be a little bit more aware of their surroundings. They have to ask, why are we leaving all those trash cans in the subways? You won't find them in Madrid, and you won't find them in London, you won't find them in Paris. Why do we find them in New York? More than just to keep our newspapers. You won't find places to hide bombs. When a, when a package is left, do you go immediately to the conductor, or is there a policeman nearby, or somebody you can tell about it? You can bet in London there is, and you can, you can bet in, in, in every city in Israel. There's somebody who's aware when something is, a, is remiss. And, and it gets to the fact that while we want everybody to be aware, we think that it, it's the usual technology is going to solve things for you. Well, technology doesn't solve anything. Even with the best technology, you still need people to interpret it and, and make something happen after it. And the best example we have of technology not being heated is the recent hurricane. They had the best technology in the world, wonderful weather reports. Nobody did anything from that. And, and what are we going to, what are we going to, how are we going to respond if we don't know that, that every level of government down to the riders are trained on what to do when something doesn't seem right on a subway or a bus? Heather McDonald, Chicago is encouraging private businesses to provide city government with live feeds from the surveillance cameras at their businesses. Is that kind of sharing okay with you, or does that uh, blur the line between private and law enforcement, that should be troubling. Well, I think, again, the, I just want to emphasize when we're talking about public surveillance cameras, we are talking about public behavior. So there's no privacy violation there. There's no Fourth Amendment expectation in your image uh, when you're walking on the street. So if you're in, the, in the issues Target, involved... you, can, you should assume that not just their security, but the NYPD or the Chicago Police Department, at least, has a right to be looking at you. 
as does everybody else on the street. Again, we are the most exhibitionist society in, in, the, in the world, in world history, I think. Everybody wants to be on camera, so the idea that this is going to somehow inhibit us, I, I think, is ludicrous. But the issues about using, you're talking about workplace from within an office? Well, presumably, again, the employees there are on notice uh, that their behavior is is being looked at on cameras. It's a it's a contract. It's consensual. Uh, if they don't want or to work in be, such a workplace, they should leave. It might be customers in uh, in, in in a place of business. Um, Donna Lieberman. I think that there's an increase um, uh, blurring of the line between private and governmental um, uh, video surveillance, and we have to be cognizant of it. Um, there may not be a a, a constitutional violation when the government um, uh, takes pictures uh, out in public. But there are certainly some serious policy considerations that we all have to worry about. And you know, I don't think it's a real choice for people to make between not working and working in a place where they're under constant video surveillance. And I don't think that, and I, and I don't think that even though we go out in public um, uh, and we know that we can be seen uh, that that's the same thing of having, as having a permanent video record in the hands of the police or some private eye you know, of, of, of where we go and who we go with and who we hold hands with or smooch with. There's something very, very different. The right to anonymity may not be written in the Constitution, but it sure is important to me and to all of us as New Yorkers. So as we approach the end of the hour, and Guy Martin, help me out again on this, a lot of people raise their hands at the beginning to say you were ambivalent about the idea of so many surveillance cameras in the subway. Of those who raised their hand and said you were ambivalent, how many are more persuaded now that it is a good and right thing to do? Two people. How many are persuaded more to the other side? Interesting. Uh, many more people now. Maybe 20 About hands. 10 times that. Yeah. yeah. So who, since that's the, the dominant reaction to the panel, uh, who who just raised your hand wants to speak up a little bit and tell us why? What did you hear here in the last um, 45 minutes or so that took you to that, uh, more to that position? I'd just like to say I spoke with Katie Lepp at the MTA last uh, week, and I asked her for $212 million, who's going to be watching those cameras? And the cameras are going to be, after the fact, if a crime is committed, no one is going to be watching those cameras. Thank you. Now, we have a, we have a gentleman over here who says he was ambivalent and now is more dissuaded. Yes? I don't think Ms. McDonald understands some of the technological implications. Um, I work in computers myself. Uh, computer technology advances very rapidly every year, and it's getting to the point that you can store every image you will ever capture, and you can index and cross-reference these images, and you will literally know where this person was from every minute of every day if you had them on the camera, and that can be stored and kept indefinitely and used for whatever purpose. Same question for someone over here who was swayed uh, more against surveillance cameras during the course of the hour? Yes. Hi, I'm still kind of ambivalent, but don't think that it's in the future that they're keeping information on you. I don't know if you know about the SEVIS system. However, I'm an American citizen. The SEVIS system is designed to track international students. Just as a happenstance, I was traveling, and I always travel with my passport. I used it going on JetBlue, and just as a lark, the clerk swiped my passport through the SEVIS system, and he says, oh, you're there. I am neither an international person nor an international student. Why am I in that system? So if, you, if you've got, think about it, you're in that SEVIS system. Somebody is already tracking you in a system that you're not even supposed to be in. So why, after that experience, are you still ambivalent about because surveillance? Because I know that surveillance cameras can help after the fact. But I think we need to be very aware that they are already tracking you. And how much of that freedom are you willing to give up for that sense of security? One more from that same group. On this side, we have a woman right over here. Hi. It was helpful to learn that there's very little deterrent effect and almost no preventive effect. That helped me understand the situation better. And did it help you? Uh, oh, it helped you decide that you're less for it than you were before? Yes. 
Right. Do you, um, let's go through the panel and get a last quick set of responses. 20 seconds each for a last word. Heather McDonald. Well, in many places there has been a deterrent effect. In, in Los Angeles's MacArthur Park downtown, when they installed surveillance cameras, the drug dealers, the prostitutes took off, and low-income Hispanic families that have been terrified to use the park were once again able to go into that public space. It, it inhibits criminals, not the law-abiding um, public. And everything is a, is a cost and balancing, cost and, and risk and benefits balance. This, this suggestion about the uh, and I have risk to stop is you true. there because we're running out of time. Robert Paswell? Uh, just uh, quickly, just invest first in people who can, who can sort of think and understand the situation and then technology second. Donna Lieberman? You don't get a comment. he will get it. Oh, okay. Um, uh, in the aftermath of September 11th, our government has um, tried to prey on our fears and convince us that we need to give up our freedom in order to be safe and secure. Our safety and security are very important, and so is our freedom, and we can have both. Guy Martin. I, th I think we live in a world of data, our medical data. The data, if we purchase our, our Metro cards with our credit cards, is logged into the mainframes in London. The Oyster card, the commuter card, is bound to identity. Um, Surveillance cameras are really a wash, but they're a great help in, in, in uh, forensic work. Thanks again to all our panelists. This hour was produced by Jim Colgan and Lisa Allison with Ilya Meritz, Priya George, Daniel McDermott, Kate Hines, and senior producer Nuala McGovern. Help from Maria Galvez Pantanin and Marta Castang. Our engineers, Edward Haber, Jennifer Munson, and David Schneerman. Special thanks to the Donald and Paula Smith Family Foundation for their support of this event. Additional thanks to Robin Billenkoff. John Kianese, Stephanie Hill Wilchford, and Kite, Olivia Kisson, Aaron Russell, Brenda Williams Butts, and the WNYC event volunteers. I'm Brian Lehrer. <laughs>